This is Black Agenda Radio, a weekly hour of African American political thought and action. Welcome to the radio magazine that brings you news, commentary, and analysis from a Black Left perspective. I'm Glenn Ford, along with my co host, Nellie Bailey. Coming up, black people get the worst health care in the United States, but we'll talk with a doctor and author who says blacks also pay more for bad health outcomes. And a researcher on education says black and brown students have every right to be outraged at the racist treatment they are subjected to in U.S. schools. But first. Brazil has long been a killing ground for black and brown people, but the carnage has increased with the election of far-right President Jair Bolsonaro, who some call the Donald Trump of South America. In just three months, police in Rio de Janeiro killed 434 people, most of them young black men. We spoke with Ja Costa Vargas, a professor of anthropology at the University of California at Riverside. Dr. Costa Vargas is from Brazil and is author of the book, The Anti-Black City, Police Terror and Black Urban Life in Brazil. We ask him if Bolsonaro is encouraging police massacres of young blacks. Absolutely, and it's not surprising at all. Bolsonaro campaigned on the promise that he would be the tough law and order president. He campaigned on the idea that the former Workers' Party administration was too lax on crime, even though it was not. And his greatest promise was to do so while making the country white again. That was the main message. So in other words, the ramping up of law and order tactics and discourse is fundamentally about controlling black people and retaking the country as it were. Yes, in the news media here in this country, there are lots of references to Bolsonaro being Brazil's Trump, but it stops there. And the conclusion that Bolsonaro, like Trump, rode to power on a, what we would call in the U.S., a white backlash, an anti-black backlash, that conclusion's not made by U.S. commentators about Bolsonaro. They speak of ecology and fires in the rainforest, which is important, but rarely about race and Brazil and Bolsonaro. Absolutely. It's one of the unspoken fundamentals of his campaign. It's not spoken in those terms either in Brazil, by the way. So it's it's a transnational phenomenon that includes the inability of the left in Brazil to this day to, to, to deal with these issues, not only of race, but blackness in particular. So when Bolsonaro campaigned, as you can see if you do a search of the images that he was intent on transmitting to the population, he's always posing with a gun, with a rifle. And the message that he was sending there, very clear message, was that the rifle would be aimed at the so-called criminal element. And in the Brazilian mind, the so-called criminal element is always a black person, a black young man. So that's how he campaigned. That's how his supporters understood his message. And that's how those who are supported by him, including the governor of Rio, Witzel, are carrying out their mandate. So Witzel, a couple of weeks ago, was seen celebrating live on TV the shooting, the lethal shooting by a sniper of a young black man who was robbing a bus on the bridge that links Rio to an adjoining city called Niterói. So that's the mandate. And that's the climate that we are now experiencing in Brazil. 
it's not only a climate of authoritarianism and fascism, but fundamentally it's a climate against black people and who, and what was perceived perceived as the undue influence of the workers party on making the lives of black people better that that was also another campaign theme that was very important for bolsonaro in other words him bolsonaro was going to reinstitute restate white rule in a country which to many people was the opposite that the Workers' Party did. The, the Workers' Party was seen as the friend of the black, the friend of the Indians, the friend of women, the friend of the LGBT communities. So Bolsonaro is the opposite of that. Yes, uh, under the Workers' Party, millions of people were lifted out of poverty, and many of them, disproportionate numbers of them, were not white. And you see, and others do as well, Bolsonaro's rise as a white reaction to that. But then why is it that we read and hear that so many people in the favelas voted for Bolsonaro? You don't have to be non-black to be anti-black. So the ways in which the Brazilian so-called racial democracy operates is that the hatred of the black and the fear of the black is widespread. So it's very common among non-whites to have the same kinds of fears, the same kinds of hatred that manifest themselves in the partners that you choose and the types of families that you constitute, and also in terms of how you see your life in terms of security. So if somebody tells you that they are going to make your life safer, that usually means they are going to be more controlling and more lethal vis-a-vis -vis black people. So that's one of the explanations that I would offer for the black support for Bolsonaro. Now, the picture is a little more complicated because if you look at the electoral maps of the latest presidential election, in cities where blacks were the majority or were in larger numbers than the country's average, Bolsonaro consistently lost. Whereas in cities where whites were the majority, or in greater proportions than the national average, Bolsonaro won. So the picture is not so simple as if we could say, well, black folks voted for Bolsonaro too. Yes, they did, but there were several interesting aspects of the electoral dynamics that suggest that many black folks saw through what Bolsonaro was trying to do. If anti-blackness is so pervasive in Brazil and including anti-blackness among black and mixed race Brazilians, how does that affect organizing among blacks and mixed race people in Brazil? That's an excellent question. And it's one that I would say has acquired different answers. So today in Brazil, there's an unprecedented number of people identifying as black. And one of the reasons why they identify as black, on the one hand, there is incentive for that. So during the Workers' Party administration, there, was, there were several public policies along the lines of affirmative action. So there was, that, that was the incentive. But there's also something else that's going on that has to do with the force of organized black folks, both in grassroots movements and also in popular culture that also provides elements with which black folks can identify. And this is relatively new. Folks of my generation, this is a completely new world. For black folks to identify as black before my generation, it took a lot more work and there were many fewer possibilities to do that. So how do Black folks today identify as blacks in spite of anti-blackness. That has to do with their ability to connect with organized groups of black people that recognize the fundamental anti-blackness of the country and also these other forms of 
uh, identification possibilities through popular culture, through other forms of organizing that are not necessarily explicitly political. So it, it's a very interesting moment. And frankly, many organized black groups today in Brazil are realizing that even the dialogue with the state and even the electoral game is fundamentally stacked against black people. So that's another debate that's going on, whether black folks should participate in these elections. So it's a new moment, and it's a very promising moment in that regard. Black folks, I think, are realizing more than ever how anti-black the very country's constitution is. So if that's the case, what is there for us to do? That's that's the question. That's what I keep hearing in many different black circles of young women, of LGBT black folk, and organized, older organized folks that are also asking themselves, what is the point to seek integration in a country that hates us? What's the point? So that it is a very depressing, difficult, and violent time, yes, but it is also a very interesting moment insofar as political strategies that were taken for granted up until now are being questioned. What's the role of black folks vis-a-vis the state, for example? So it's, in that regard, I, I remain cautiously optimistic insofar as there are new modes of thinking, new modes of political thinking being discussed, and new ways of black people understanding themselves within the Brazilian empire state. But you referred earlier to the inability of the Brazilian left, the white left, uh, to speak or think or act decisively in racial terms, despite the fact that so many black and brown Brazilians did benefit from the social democratic policies of the Workers' Party. But that seems to be a a problem, I call it the Latin American disease, throughout Latin America for the left, that leftists can't address race effectively. You are absolutely right, Mr. Ford, and Brazil and the Workers' Party in particular would be a prime example of it. So even though the Workers' Party did come up with quite effective programs, and I want to emphasize the term programs that targeted historically excluded populations, indigenous populations, LGBT populations, and fundamentally black folks, they were quite successful in implementing these public policies, those policies were programmatic only, meaning they ultimately, I would argue, had no structural impact on the lives of black people. So much so that it took a mere new president to come in and most of these gains are being reversed already, including public security. Now, there's an important parenthesis to be made here. Even though the Workers' Party did gesture toward black people and somehow gesture toward a better understanding of racial dynamics in the, in the country, the Workers' Party ultimately, and it pains me to say this because I, I was a supporter of the Workers' Party for a long time, it pains me to say it, but the numbers show that the Workers' Party was utterly unable to deal with the greater vulnerability to violence that black people experience, including including the violence perpetrated by the state, to such an extent that when homicide rates were going down for the country as a whole during the Workers' Party administration, the federal administration, homicide rates for black people were going up. So that speaks of this blindness that you mentioned, the blindness vis-a-vis race in general, but blackness in particular. And that means that for the Workers' Party and the left in general today, the issue that matters the most, the underlying issue that we need to fight against is class inequalities. And that was in display during the campaign. The left had to scramble with Lula being incarcerated. The left had to scramble to find allies and constitute a viable political bloc 
and the discourse emphasized race to such an extent that many of the leftists, including the Workers' Party candidate, said the following, it's time for the identitarian politics be put aside and we need to fight the fundamental fight, which is the class struggle. And there you have it. And I agree with you. It's not only a so-called Latin American phenomenon. I would say this is a global phenomenon, the refusal to engage with race in general, but even more so the central place of anti-blackness in these formations of nation and empire. It's not so much about race as it is about the central place that black people have in countries like Brazil as the representation of everything that the country should not be. And that, of course, has to do with a country that ultimately would be dominated and governed by black people, for black people, who in Brazil are the majority. In other words, what we are getting at here is that ultimately the fear in Brazil is that Brazil becomes a black nation, becomes a Haiti nation. And that's the greatest fear. And I think that explains a lot of what you just mentioned earlier in the interview, which is these public security policies that now shoot to kill are the contemporary translation of the specter of Haiti in Brazil. That was Dr. Jao Costa Vargas speaking from the University of California at Riverside. We all know that black folks are disproportionately given subprime loans by banks. But Dr. Leslie Hinkson says the same is true in health care. Dr. Hinkson is co-editor of a new book titled Subprime Health, Debt and Race in U.S. Medicine. Well, in thinking about this volume and in coming up with the title, actually, I was actually thinking a lot about the subprime loan crisis and the ways in which it affected Blacks in this country much more than it did any other group. And in thinking about the ways in which race-based or racialized medicine in our country, not just now, but throughout its history, the ways in which the wellness and health of Black people in America have actually been undervalued. And not just that their health has been undervalued, but the cost of getting basically subpar healthcare in this country have actually historically been higher for African Americans. And so this idea that you get bad care, right, but bad care that not only leads to further undermining your health, but also you end up having to pay more for it ultimately, for that care ultimately than whites for sure in this country. I think that that's where the title comes from. But you also say that we shouldn't be focusing so much or solely on the racial disparities in health care, which are statistically provable and always have been, but we should look at the anti-blackness that is behind it. Oh, yes, for sure. I mean, if you take a really close look at where racial health disparities basically originate, it's not as many people would like to claim it originates in some genetic or innate biological disposition of black folks. It's ultimately tied to the lived conditions of African Americans. When you live in places that are much more likely to have high levels of toxins, like lead, for example, when you're more likely to live in places where there isn't safe drinking water, when you're more likely to be living in places where there's a high level of gun violence, when you happen to live in places that are of poor quality in terms of housing stock, but you end up paying much more of your paycheck to live in those subpar conditions. And when ultimately you are also all of this time under the surveillance of the state, there's absolutely no way, there's absolutely no way that you can, like just statistically speaking, 
live as healthy a life as individuals who don't have to live under those conditions, right? And those conditions are all part of the history of anti-Blackness in this country. Yes, we all know that if there are toxins in the environment, that's bad for your health, and that there are more toxins in Black environments than in other folks' environments. But we've also learned that the stress of Black life in America Mm -hmm. kills you. But the medical establishment has resisted that idea, and many of them still do. Yeah, I mean, I will say that more and more, particularly individuals who are studying things like very low birth weight or maternal mortality rates in this country, more and more of them are actually starting to steer towards this idea that racism is the underlying cause. That being said, not enough of them are actually moving that way. And I think it's in large part because of how doctors are trained, right? And what medicine is. Medicine is basically charged with biologizing everything, medicalizing everything. And very little attention in the past and even today has actually been given to training doctors to think about, oh, right, what are the social, what are the environmental factors behind this individual's ill health or lack of wellness? What are those? Because that's not how doctors are trained. They are trained to think only of biology and what is under the skin, while at the same time, they are very often trained to actually look at things like skin color in order to try and make predictions about what kind of disease you might have and also come up with predictions about whether or not you are actually going to adhere to your treatment plan, whether or not your treatment plan is too complicated because you may not seem as intelligent as other types of patients and ultimately come up with a course of treatment for what seems to ail you. I mean, there has been an increase in the number of, I guess, what I'd call activist doctors who are doing things like saying, I'm going to write you a prescription for more outdoor playtime. I'm going to write you a prescription for healthy food in the farmer's market. But, you know, those doctors are few, right, and far between. And, you know, those doctors ultimately can't force insurance companies and other social service organizations to actually honor those prescriptions. So when doctors immediately jump to the conclusion that there is some biological root to the maladies that folks are suffering, they then conclude that the high instance of high blood pressure in Black America has something to do with Black bodies. Yes, unfortunately. Although what's really, really interesting, you know, you talk to doctors, as I have done and continue to do, and interview them and ask them, well, what is race? And, you know, 98% of those doctors will say, well, you know, race is a social construction. And they're, I mean, they're well-educated individuals, and they're well-versed in the idea that race as a concept is socially constructed. But then when you ask them, well, are there any instances in which you don't think of race as a social construction, but it's biological, for example, in your practices? And one of the first things they'll jump to, the ones who do admit to doing this are like, oh, yeah, well, so, for example, with hypertension, you know, I would not give a beta blocker to an African-American. Calcium channel blockers seem to be, you know, that's the sweet spot. And then you try and get them to explain why that is. And some of them actually have no idea. They'll say, oh, something to do with, I think, nitric oxide. You know, it's way back in the recesses of their brains from their medical training. But some of them will actually say, well, you know, growing evidence that hypertension is a different disease in African Americans than it is in other people. There is even the idea that the pathways through which the disease works are also different. And then when you ask them, well, how is that possible if race is a social construction? They can't answer. And so I think a lot of this boils down to, number one, 
the ways in which doctors are trained to think about and use race during their medical training. Number two, the ways in which they're socialized into race-based treatment through their rounds and their residencies. And then number three, there is a whole structure in place to help ensure that at least for some illnesses and some diseases, that that's what they're meant to do. For example, if you are a doctor who's prescribing beta blockers to an African-American for hypertension, your insurance company could actually look at this and say, well, you know, aren't beta blockers, you know, sort of con like contraindicated, you know, for African Americans, we don't know if we're going to cover that prescription. So this is what I mean by there being certain structures in place to help ensure that doctors practice a certain type of medicine that is often racially informed. You wrote this wonderful sentence in the article that you did for a Black Agenda report. You said, racial health is a product of social conditions that come to register at the level of the body. In other words, the racism in society is written in Black bodies. Yeah, and I get it. We live in a capitalist society, right? And so even if we understand that these health conditions that we see disproportionately in black and brown communities, even when we understand that they are the product of lived conditions that then, you know, get embedded in the body, rather than saying, let's spend all of the money and political capital that we need to in order to try and eradicate these conditions that lead to these very real biological effects. Rather than do that, we say, you know what, let's not tinker with society. Let's create a pill. Let's work in a lab that is funded by the U.S. government and by taxpayer dollars. Let's create a drug. Let us patent it. And let us use that in order to make profit while we also say we are doing good and trying to heal this community, you know, of what ails it. You note that many institutions in the post-civil rights era have adopted colorblind approaches to racial equality. But what has medicine done? That's why medicine is such an interesting case. Medicine is the only institution in this country that I know of that outwardly conceptualizes and operationalizes race as biological. And they do it in plain sight. Like, this is the one institution that has never taken a colorblind approach. The only way in which medicine as an institution can be seen as one that takes even kind of a colorblind approach has been, well, there are two things. Number one, not analyzing a lot of the history of medicine that, that was based in plantation medicine, right? And many, many of the assumptions that we make about black bodies in medicine today harken back to plantation medicine, which was racist medicine. And the fact that medicine is so ahistorical and hasn't confronted this part of their past and hasn't actually been that willing to say, hey, let's be critical about the ways in which race does inform our practice. I think that's one way in which medicine is colorblind, even though in practice, you know, they like race is taken into account. The second way in which medicine is colorblind is in its denial, I guess you'd say, for a very, very long time in thinking about the ways in which racism in our societies has deleterious health effects as opposed to assuming things like your behavior must be pathological. Maybe you're not health literate thinking about all of the things that Black people lack supposedly innately or culturally, as opposed to thinking about how resilient Black bodies have to be in so many instances in this country, even to maintain the level of health that we enjoy now, which 
as you mentioned earlier, is considerably lower than that of our white counterparts. You know, people ask, what are doctors supposed to do? Are they supposed to ignore race? Are they supposed to ignore the fact that health disparities do exist? And my answer to that is no. What we want to push medicine and biomedicine to do is to reconceptualize, actually reconceptualize race as a social construction that actually places people at different levels of the racial hierarchy at higher or lower risk for certain medical conditions. And using that knowledge to offer individualized care to their patients. So we're not saying to not think about race, but truly think about it as a social conception and also do your job as a doctor and speak to your patients. Make sure that you use their medical history and make sure that you understand that not every single black patient is alike. The same way in which we don't try and distinguish between German Americans and Italian Americans and Spanish Americans and Norwegian Americans. The same way that we don't say, oh, you know, this group of people is much more likely, you know, to be at risk for X. But yeah, we just say, okay, fine. Who are you? Let's look at your medical history. Make sure that you're very careful about doing that with your black patients as well. And not just immediately thinking about, oh, what are the positive, what are the things I got to look for with this person today, simply because of what the color of their skin is. So that's number one. And I think the second thing that I would like listeners and readers of our book to think about as well is how is this discussion about race-based medicine possibly tied to, you know, the renewed discussions we've been having about reparations in this country? One of the primary things we do is to connect race-based medicine and racialized medicine to the concept of debt. And one of the ways in which we conceptualize debt has to do with what debts do this country owe to African Americans from a history of slavery, Jim Crow, medical neglect, you know, medical experimentation. How can the medical establishment and biomedicine writ large try and earn back the trust? of African Americans. And there's some ways in which certain medical projects in this country have been designed in some ways as a project of reparative justice. And many of those projects have not so far lived up to its promise. But I think probably the most well-known example is that of VITAL, the pill that was developed supposedly because it actually worked better in African Americans than in others to help treat individuals with congestive heart disease, congestive heart failure. And it failed spectacularly, like in large part, because it was based on faulty science and also on just really, really bad interpretations of statistical data that were derived from the trials for the drug. That being said, we are at this critical moment right now in biomedicine where CRISPR technology is now entering into its human subject phase. What's that? CRISPR is a technology that's designed to edit out abnormalities in our genetic code. So a couple of the trials that are underway right now are actually targeting certain types of cancer. So with CRISPR, they can go through and they can locate specific genes and edit them in the hopes that in doing so, the person will now no longer have cancer. There are also trials underway for individuals with blood disorders. And one of the first human subjects in this country that we have is a woman who has sickle cell disease. And people living with sickle cell disease, you know, are often under so much pain. And for a very long time, the medical establishment didn't really expend much energy or many resources in 
helping to figure out how we might be able to not even just cure the disease, but how to treat it. And I'm not talking about the trait, having the trait. I'm talking about individuals who have the disease. How do we help them live relatively pain-free, dignified lives? Well, now with CRISPR, one of the first human subjects who's actually agreed in actually helping them to study whether the effectiveness of CRISPR in helping to eradicate, at least within the individual, and of course, then subsequently his or her genetic line, because that's one of the things about CRISPR, it changes your genetic code. So if you were then going to have children, the idea is that you wouldn't have certain genes to pass on anymore. The fact that an African-American woman is one of their first confirmed subjects excites me because, oh my goodness, right, if people could live lives free of this disease, that would be amazing. But it also slightly terrifies me as well. Given the history of experimentation on African Americans in this country, and also given the fact that very often the medical advances that actually get created because of that experimentation, African Americans have then actually not been able to enjoy because of things like segregated hospitals and clinics back in the day, the lack of providers in African American communities today, and also the fact that African Americans still have higher rates of lack of health insurance. And even when they do have health insurance, it's actually often hard for them to find care. I worry that even if something remarkable comes of this, I worry that African Americans won't actually be able to enjoy the fruits of their willingness to take part in these clinical trials. That was Dr. Leslie Hinkson speaking from New York City. The corporate media has long been obsessed with violence in urban schools, but they seldom consider the violence that the schools exert against black and brown students. Dr. Connie Wan is an analyst and researcher who advocates for women and girls of color. Dr. Wan wrote an influential article in the Feminist Wire titled Racialized and Gendered Violence Permeates Schools Discipline. She began the article with the plight of Jada Williams, an eighth grade student in Rochester, New York. She does this history project around trying to trace through the experiences of Black people trying to learn, trying to have access to education, and then is able to identify that this moment is so very similar to that of which she was studying. So I think it relates to Black students today. And I think in many ways, it also relates to other students of color, even if slightly different. I think the access, the punishment for wanting to learn may be different and more specific to Black students. Yes. And in fact, rather than recognizing this young woman's perception, she was punished by teachers and administrators and wound up eventually having to leave the school. Right. And I I think a lot of people today, when they talk about the school to prison pipeline, which has become a kind of popular tagline or a popular discourse, what we don't seem to understand is that schools in themselves are sites of captivity. And the problem isn't only that she was punished and then kind of kicked out of school. It was the punishment within that we don't pay enough attention to that I think we might need to change our analysis or extend our analysis a bit more. So looking at the various ways, the different ways that Black girls in particular are punished by schools. Well, yes, these teachers and administrators do a lot of analysis, but it appears to be 180 degrees wrong. This young woman was labeled a problem student, and she was typed as angry, the angry young Black woman. I think that has been, in my research, what I'm learning. So the the articles and the, the journals that you are referencing, the publications that you're referencing, 
as part of a larger project by which I have been able to kind of sit through and look at the different ways that Black students and in particular Black girls are being punished throughout the disciplinary landscape. And so we have to think about the architecture of the school as a punitive landscape, right, where students are now being subject to surveillance cameras. They are being subject to security on campus. They're being subject to having to wear IDs on campus. They're police officers on campus. So that's a type of punishment. And people tend to think that will push kids out of school. And then that's the problem. When in fact, the architecture of the school, what's happening to them is already a carceral catastrophe or rather a carceral condition. So that's one thing I want us to kind of think through when we think about the school to prison pipeline or these analyses that you're talking about. I also want us to think about, so here, here is the architecture. And then we want to think about the day-to-day experiences that these students are experiencing. So my work also looks at the antagonisms and the harassment that they experience by the teachers, where they are kicked out of school for wanting to learn differently or have different learning desires. Or I have a, in one of the other examples that I have, there are several students that I have worked with or studied that have said they've gotten in trouble for standing up to throw pieces of paper away or raising their hand to speak at inappropriate times. Those are also forms of punishment and discipline that we also have to think about, which don't necessarily push the students out of school because a lot of these kids are going to stay in school and in fact endure these captive conditions. So there's the architecture, there's the day-to-day experiences, and then there's also the experiences that especially the girls have with their peers that we don't also kind of look at as a part of the carceral captive condition. And what I mean by that is the young girls, they are experiencing harassment, gender harassment, racial harassment from their classmates, whether that be sexual harassment and or, you know, they get taunted and there aren't any protections around that for them. So in a couple of other publications that are have written, I've talked to students who say things like, In one school, there was a situation by which a couple of their classmates created a fake Instagram account. And on this Instagram account, they only put pictures of all of the Black girls at school. And under each picture in this Instagram account of these girls, each picture had something about the girls' sex lives. So here you have this Instagram account that's getting published and distributed and all the kids are making fun of them at school. And so when the girls try to figure out who created this account, the campus administrators come to them and say, if you continue to do this, we're going to need to suspend you. So they get punished for trying to assert their agency. They get punished by their classmates and they have no idea who's doing it. Right. So there's like this kind of ghostly figures around campus that are like making them the object of ridicule and they have no way of standing up for themselves. And then they're threatened with punishment. And of course, a normal and healthy response to that kind of situation is to be angry. But you write, in fact, that there is the necessity for a kind of rage if people are going to, including students, politically resist these oppressions. Exactly. Dr. Maya Angelou has said before, and I think there are other amazing Black feminist scholars who have said, you know, we need to be angry. Right. And so these young folks, they the part of the punishment of living under captive conditions, as I'm sure many of us understand, is we don't get to experience pain and people don't get to experience their feelings. That's a part of the punishment. So when the young people are angry, we must allow them to be angry because that's a part of being human. You want to allow them access to their humanity. Whereas the schools punish them for being human, let alone create a political response. So I wanted to really think through, like, you know, you see other white children when they're acting out in the classroom. Oh, that child is just, you know, part of their growing, their maturity. But I think what we also don't see is when they adultify black children. 
they're not just adultifying them, they're dehumanizing, right? Like they're not, like black children are not allow, allowed to have feelings. I think that's a really important thing for us to think through when we think about captive conditions as a result of schooling in the U.S. Yes, it appears from what you've described that in the schools specifically, they have institutionalized a worldview that is very similar, almost identical for the one that blames black culture rather than centuries of white supremacy for all of the ills of the black community. Right. That So blaming black communities for quote unquote ills is, is, um, is a problem. But also what they consider to be ills is also the problem. So we think about the young people in the articles or the young people at the schools that are quote unquote acting out. That should not be seen as an ill. That should be seen as something is wrong with this schooling system. And that is the ill. Yes, something is wrong with the schooling system, which is dominated by a white supremacist ideology, and those who practice it in the schools are defending that ideology. Sadly, you know, even the best, you know, warm-hearted teacher, what ends up happening is they're upholding a series of systems and ideologies and practices consciously or unconsciously. And that's a key thing because a lot of people will say, well, I didn't mean to do that. And that makes sense. But what we don't get to tackle in our politics sometimes is our unconscious commitment to these systems and these structures that shape everyday realities. Well, some of these commitments that they make uh, to more policing in schools are not unconscious at all. And I'd venture to say that in the four years since you wrote this essay, there are more police in the schools as a response to the hysteria around mass shootings and that these police are allowed to operate, to behave in a more paramilitary manner. This is very true. There, there is a lot more pushes for increased surveillance and policing mechanisms in the school. But I, and I think that's completely dangerous. However, I also want us to think about the regular teachers who do a lot more policing than the police. And we want to think about the administrators who do a lot more policing than the police. Because in some of the work that I've done, what I've learned is that legally administrators are state sanctioned to police. Right. They have more authority to police than the actual police. Yes, certainly. That's what happened with Jada Williams, the young woman at the top of your essay. The school administrators and teachers made a decision that she was the problem and they ran her out of school. Exactly. And I also that that also reminds me that a part of the condition of captivity in schools is the humiliation. So if we go back and we think through kind of conditions of, you know, what people imagine slavery to being over, but what we don't seem to think about is how the conditions are played out today, which means, and I think Dr. Orlando Patterson talks about this, Dr. Frank Wilderson talks about this, there is a sense of gratuitous punishment, right? And so we see that playing out in the schools, but there's also this humiliation, There is no reason to humiliate these kids the way that they do in the schools today. And so when we pay attention to the paramilitary, that's super important. But we don't also pay attention to the day-to-day activities of humiliating children so that they don't speak or they're too afraid to have feelings. Because that plays out for the rest of their lives. That doesn't get archived and that doesn't get kind of, that doesn't get the spotlight. Because we're more, we're inclined to say, well, the discipline record looks like 50 suspensions, 30 expulsions, but we don't account for the thousands of times these kids are humiliated throughout the course of their pre-K to university career. That doesn't get measured. And that has a lot of impact because whenever I give talks or when people have read my articles, people will constantly come up and somehow there will always be tears, always be tears because those experiences don't get accounted for. So we see it in Jada Williams' experience, right? We see it in several other, you know, articles that I've written and the girls have talked about. Teachers just don't like me because I'm Black. Like, they'll say these things, and we act as if that's supposed to roll off our backs. Like, oh, that's okay. 
but that's not okay. What does that mean to feel like you are not liked? And then you have to walk into these situations every day with people who don't like you. For more than 50 years, I've been covering Black contentions that white teachers are failing Black students. But in all those 50 years, the proportion of Black teachers has in fact decreased and white women have increased in their proportion in schools that are attended by Black students. Right. So there is indeed a large population, and I don't have the statistics with me, there is a large population of white women teachers. That's actually been the case for a long time. I think there's also institutions like Teach for America, or now there are these alternative programs that recruit teachers from more affluent schools and bring them into urban schools. And there's a major disconnect between the teachers and the students, clearly. But what also ends up happening is a cultural disconnect and an empathic disconnect that also needs to kind of be highlighted as well. There's a perpetual othering that happens when there's a white woman that comes in to teach black children. And then they think that if they have this Black Lives Matter sign around the school, that that's enough. And what really needs to happen is a deep immersement into not only the culture, but the politics. And I think they think that politics is cursory. I would recommend that in we, if we are to have white women as teachers or even other teachers in general have to have educational experiences that engross them in black politics in order to best not only understand, but to serve black children. Well, certainly just having a Black Lives Matter sign on the school grounds isn't enough. But well, what about demands for community control of the schools to move the nexus of authority away from these teachers and administrators who keep on failing these students and put the power in the community where these students come from? I think that's actually a really um, great movement and great ideas. The problem with that is that it ends up being a charter school versus public school conversation. And I won't venture into that, but I will say that there are a lot of studies that talk about schools that are community controlled, that do center the experiences of Black teachers and Black youth. I think there are schools in Chicago that specifically are controlled by communities And there's a lot of, quote unquote, social justice curriculum involved in that. I think there's the June Jordan School out here that is also very socially justice oriented, which leads me back to a point where the community control in itself is not the only solution. Right. And neither is identity politics. I think what has to happen again is a repoliticization of schooling and curriculum. Culture and identity is not enough to help us to better understand what's happening to our students and also how to make fundamental changes to the systems that have created their current situation. Repoliticization of the schools. Actually, many teachers and administrators believe that That is their nemesis. That's what they shouldn't do. And that that allows political considerations to interfere with their educating abilities. Well, you know, I appreciate you saying that, but everything is political. So when a black child goes to a school with a curriculum that is predominantly Eurocentric, white, and or misses setting any part of racism and or anti-blackness, like that is a set of politics. It's white hegemony. So when people say politicization is a nemesis, it's actually what are the politics? Fundamentally, it's black politics is the nemesis, not just politics. So we kind of have to be clear about that for them. And I also think about we have to expand what politicization also means. So I take a couple steps back and I want to talk about like different community organizations and different community organizers that I think about and work with who do such a great job in education. So I have worked with an organization called Girls for Gender Equity, and they are this amazing organization run by Black feminists, Black queer feminists, uh, Joanne Smith in Brooklyn. And they just did a research project a couple of years ago, which I helped them to do. And 
we did a lot of political education in that. They did a lot of readings. They went out into the community and they researched the students to find out what the students needed. And then when they did that, they came up with a policy report or a series of recommendations that have now informed the Department of Education, New York's Department of Education. I find that kind of educational praxis to be the most useful to our students. So we have to reconsider what schooling looks like, and especially when I say politicize the school. I think there are already community organizations that are doing this. So we can duplicate what they do and bring it back to the community and bring it back to the school. I also think about, you know, there's an organization called Project Mia. There's a website that I really love. It's called transform.org, transformharm.org. And on this website, there is a huge hub of resources and curriculum on community accountability, on prison abolition, on restorative justice, on transformative justice. It's a huge political site and it's a huge educational site. So all of that is to say that there are community organizations that are already doing the type of education that I think schools would benefit from because what they're trying to do is to serve students through these alternative forms of education. You've been listening to the Black Agenda Report on the Progressive Radio Network. Information for liberation.